will be uh, presented by Dr. Ryan So Poor. Thank you, Vincent, for that kind introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Sokol, and I welcome the advisement of Professor Lee Lin and Professor Luke Lee at the University of California, Berkeley. And so today, I'm going to be talking about our recent development of a microclick diode that uses a single microbead in order to rectify fluid flow under ultra-low Reynolds number conditions. Uh, so first, I'm going to be talking about why we want to be developing a microclick diode. Then I'll talk about our concept specifically, the single microbead based microfluidic diet. Uh, then, after presenting some of our experimental results, I'll go into some details regarding the future work of this project. So, in terms of the overall state of the field for microfluidics, I'll actually be referring to an editorial written by George Whitesides in Lab and Chip a little over a year ago. And so, there he talks about how many people in the field expected that with microfluidic technology would also come a proliferation of commercial lab and chip systems. Uh, what he also notes is that at this time, that expected revolution has not yet happened. And so he posits the question, why not? So looking over the last 10 years of microfluidics, we've seen a number of truly impressive developments. Uh, researchers have been able to take advantage of the benefits associated with microfluidics, such as the low reagent volumes and the rapid reaction time. But one thing you'll note is that if you take a look at these figures on the right, uh, you'll see that in order to be able to utilize these systems, you do need a significant number of these external interconnects. So typically, you'll have a lab setup such as this, where you have a computer which is used to control a pressure pump, which is simultaneously controlling all of the different interconnects that are connected to these devices. And that is to control the fluidic pressures and also to control the valve functions. So while this kind of setup is ideal really for research laboratories in academia, uh, as well as in R&D labs, uh, for commercial lab and chip applications, uh, portable applications, uh, we really need to be developing our self-contained microfluidic systems uh, that do not require so much external regulation. Uh, but in order to get there, uh, what we need to do in a way is take a step back and focus on developing microfluidic components that are capable of performing autonomous functionalities on chip. So the microfluidic component that I'll be talking about today are microfluidic diodes, or one-way flow valves that promote fluid flow in one direction while preventing fluid flow in the opposite direction. And microfluidic diodes are critical to a number of emerging biomedical applications. And the example that I've shown here is for a simple drug delivery input. And so here, at certain times, you want to be able to release chemicals into the body, such as insulin. Uh, what you never want to happen is for a number of biological fluids to be able to enter back into your device and contaminate your system. And so in this, in this kind of circumstance, uh, a microfluidic diode would be ideal. So what's the problem? Well, to get there, what you have to do is look at the navier sosa equation in terms of the Reynolds number. And so for emerging micro and nanofluidic applications, uh, what you'll find is that increasingly, the Reynolds number is approaching zero. And so in this case, the nonlinear inertial terms of the navier source equation become negligible. And with, what you're left with is referred to as Stokes' flow. So why do we care? Well, for a number of microfluidic technologies, right now we're using what are called fixed geometry valves, such as Tesla valves or nozzles. And in this case, uh, you essentially have a valve that is able to have the same geometry, but because of the inertia of the fluid, it will have higher flow in one direction versus the opposite direction. However, what you'll notice that is that as the Reynolds number begins to decrease, the diodicity, that is the ratio of fluid flow in the forward versus the backwards direction, also decreases. And so at lower Reynolds number, you'll find that these kind of fixed geometry valves resemble more of a resistor <coughs> than a diode. So in order to overcome this issue, researchers have been developing microfluidic diodes for lower Reynolds number applications. And so the most popular is the microfluidic flap valve, which, to, which was developed by uh, Stephen Clay's lab over at Stanford. And so the way that this works is you essentially have a flap that hangs down from the top of a channel. And then when fluid flows in the leftward direction, it impacts this flap, which obstructs fluid flow in that direction. Then in the reverse direction, 
when the fluid flow impacts this flap, the force actually causes the flap to displace, promoting fluid flow in that direction. So previously, researchers have reported diodicities ranging from roughly 1.1 to 4.6, but Reynolds' number ranging from about 1 to 35. The issue here is that researchers have also reported that for a Reynolds number of approximately 0.3, there simply just is not enough fluidic force to displace this flap. And so this presents an issue for emerging micro nanofluidic applications that function at lower Reynolds number than 0.3. So at last year's transducers, uh, Kevin Wu and Wu Xiao from the University of British Columbia presented a microbead based diode. And the way that this works is that initially, you have a channel down here. I'm sorry for the people in the back who cannot see over the heads. Uh, but there's a channel down here uh, where the microbead suspension is inputted. And after the microbead suspension has been inputted into the system, uh, once you, you then actually seal this channel, and then for leopard flow, because of the length of the microbeads that are being arrayed, uh, the fluid has to pass through that, which obstructs fluid flow in that direction. However, for rightward fluid flow, as you can see, this length here is uh, much less in a relative sense. And so as a result, they were able to report diodicities ranging from approximately 10 to 27, uh, for Reynolds number ranging from approximately 0.1 to 1. And additionally, it's noteworthy to mention that this technology was developed uh, using a one mass sophotography process. And this is, in contrast, to the majority of microfluidic valves and uh, diodes uh, that often utilize multi-layer fabrication processes, which are limited in terms of fabrication time, cost, and labor. Uh, the issue here is that, obviously, as you can see, uh, there is a significant number of microbeads that are loaded into this system. And they use roughly 250 to 700 to be able to achieve these diodicities. And so for us here today, uh, what we wanted to be able to do was to develop a single layer of microbeads diode that uses just a single microbead in order to rectify fluid flow under ultra-low Reynolds number of conditions. So the concept is actually quite simple in theory, uh, which is basically to scale down a macro-scale ball check valve to the micro-scale. Uh, but there are actually a couple of challenges that come into play. Uh, the first of which is that unlike at the macro scale, when you can simply just take a ball and place it physically into the valve chamber, uh, at the micro scale, there is some question of how do you load a microbead into such a system. Uh, using suspensions of microbeads, this aspect actually isn't too difficult, and you can always flow in microbeads into this kind of diode chamber. Uh, the real problem comes about when you reverse the flow and you find that you've now lost the microbead in your system. And so the real question is, how do you load, but then also retain the microbead in your system? So to get to this point, uh, previously at last year's transducers, we presented a technology called MicroPost Array Ramp. And the way that this works, that you essentially have uh, two inputted fluid flows in parallel, and you also have a number of microposts which are arrayed within the channel. Then, when you input a suspension of microbeads, the microbeads will actually be railed or transported into the adjacent flow streams uh, in the process. And so this is actually the very first process ever developed to be able to rail microbeads in a microbeading system. Uh, and so what you'll see here are videos of our experimental results of microbeads being railed from the blue solution to the clear solution. Uh, another aspect that I'll mention briefly is that our camera takes pictures at two different times of orange and blue and combines them. So if you see an orange and blue bead, that's not magic. It's just two different times that are going to be merged. So the other aspect that we noticed uh, was that actually if you load just a single suspension of microbeads, and then you reverse the flow polarity during this process, uh, we found that we could actually use this technology uh, similar to a one-way track for microbeads. And we felt this might be a potential way in order to solve the issue of microbead retention. So this is the overall, the overall architecture of our single microbead-based microfluidic diode. And so the way that this works is initially, a single microbead is preloaded into our system under what we call reverse flow. Uh, once the microbead is in the diode chamber, you can then reverse the flow polarity for what we call forward flow, and we'll find that the microbead remains within the diode chamber. Uh, the other aspect to note is that because the microbead has been displaced, flow through what we call the trapping channel is unobstructed. Then when you reverse the flow polarity, the microbead is then transported back to the entrance of the trapping channel. And once there, it obstructs fluid flow through this channel. So using COMSOL, we simulated this process, and we found that we were able to achieve theoretical diodicities using a single microbead of approximately 1.4. 
I'm not going to go into detail regarding our, uh, our fabrication process, mainly because we use a standard one mass stop photography process uh, using PMS. Now, the part that I will note is that similar to the prior work, we do use separate channels for the microbead loading, which are then sealed after a single microbead has been loaded into the diode chamber. So these are some of our experimental results. And so first what you're going to see is a single microbead being loaded into the diode chamber. And as you can see, it will rail on the micropost, but then be inputted into the diode chamber. Uh, next is the forward, the forward flow case, where the microbead is released, but as you can see, it is retained within the diode chamber. And again, for reverse flow, the microbead uh, is transported to the entrance of the trapping chip. And so we found this process to be highly repeatable. Uh, but one of the interesting things that we did see was that for the forward flow versus the reverse flow case, uh, the microbead actually follows two different flow paths. And so for the forward flow case, as you can see, the microbead uh, lifts off and begins sort of railing along the microposts. Uh, but then when you reverse the flow polarity, because of the fluid flow through the gaps between microposts, it sort of hugs the bottom of the channel uh, and then is transported to the entrance of the trapping chip. So these are our core uh, experimental results for this process. And so these are for two different experiments. Uh, one set of experiments are for uh, a system with a single microbead in the diode, and those are in blue. Uh, and the other set of experiments are for a completely open system for our negative control. And so the main trend that we ended up finding was that as the Reynolds number increased, uh, so too did the diodicities. And we found that we were specifically able to achieve average diodicities ranging from roughly 1.14 to 2.51 uh, over the range of uh, Reynolds number varying from 0.05 to 0.25. So moving forward in the future, where do we want to go? Uh, so while we were able to achieve diodicities essentially on par with some of the other microfluidic diodes, uh, genuinely we do want to be able to improve upon this diodicity performance. So how do we do that? Uh, well, there's two main ways that we're looking at right now. Uh, the first of which is actually we began uh, arraying these in series and in parallel. And previously, researchers have shown that you can array diodes in series in order to improve diodicity performance. Uh, personally, though, I think that the more likely way uh, will be this method. And so to get there, we have to actually look at the way that the diode is formed right now. And so because we take advantage of that single layer soft photography process, what we end up with is a trapping channel that is essentially rectangular in design. And this is an issue because we are then trapping a spherical microbead in a rectangular channel. And so for anyone who's worked with uh, any type of microbead trapping, uh, you'll know that there still is a significant amount of fluid flow that's able to bypass the microbead. And so what we want to do to be able to prevent, prevent this issue is to move forward with circular microchannels, which ideally might be able to prevent all this excess flow from going through. And so with that, uh, in conclusion, uh, we've demonstrated the very first Microfluidic diode that uses a single microbead in order to rectify fluid flow autonomously under ultra low Reynolds number conditions. Uh, we were achieved, able to achieve diodicities ranging from approximately 1.14 to 2.51, uh, which provides an important baseline for future bead based microfluidic diodes. I didn't go into too much detail about this aspect, uh, but we were using microbeads and microposts, which were essentially the exact same size. And we feel that this implies that there is potential to possibly scale this down to essentially be able to create nanofluidic bead-based diodes. And in the future, as I mentioned, we are going to try to look at arranging these diodes in series or in parallel, as well as using circular microchannels in order to be able to improve our overall diodicity performance. And with that, I want to give thanks to everyone who's played a role in this project and helped out with this presentation. And I especially want to thank all of my students who are part of the M3B lab back at Berkeley. And with that, I'll open up the floor for questions. Thank you.